Good morning. Glad everyone is here with us today. It is a, another beautiful day to be able to come out and worship God in spirit and in truth. If you would be turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Talked to Eric few days ago and knew that he wasn't going to be here and or sign you actually did and and I uh, told him I would take care of this lesson for him today I know he's missing being here and speaking and he enjoys doing this as well as several of us but we're glad that they're doing well home from the hospital and I know they look forward to getting back here Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 is known as the verses of unity. And it gives us the seven ones of unity in this particular passage. And I want to read Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and then we're going to get into our lesson and, and go further. We're going to look at just one of these ones of unity. But we want to read this entire passage first. It says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, and even as you are called, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. We're going to key in on verse 4, the last phrase, even as there is one hope of your calling. You're called in one hope of the calling. Today I want to look at things that unite us, since this passage deals with unity. And there are things that do unite us, but we're going to look at that one hope of that unity. If you look at the text, we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We have to have that unity with one another. When there's division, there is sin. When it's the wrong kind of division. There are two types of division we do know. There is an approved division where we have to stand up for what is right and divide ourselves from those that are wrong. But then there's that division that when we can't work together as brethren because someone is doing wrong and someone is sinning, then there's a problem. And this is why the Bible teaches us about unity. And we're to endeavor, we're to strive, we're to work at it hard to try to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now I'll ask for a show of hands, how many love division? How many love problems? How many love war here? How many want to see things go bad and want to see people hurt? I don't think any of us do, do we? That's why we're to try to keep peace as much as we can. The Bible does tell us, as much as in us is, live peaceably with all men. Paul told the Romans in Romans 12. But there has to be a standard. The standard can't be what I think unity is versus what you think unity is. We have to set a standard of what it, ha it can be and what it must be. And that standard is the doctrine that we find in the New Testament. And of those doctrines... Paul lists seven, of which one we're going to focus on is the one hope. We know there is unity in hope. But what is it about having hope is unifying? What is it? What causing us having one hope unifies us together? Well, first of all, it's because of having a common goal. If we have that one hope, we have a common goal. What is our hope? Our hope is heaven. Is that our common goal? Absolutely. So we must endeavor as we keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and having this one hope that we're hoping for, anticipating, longing for heaven. And we do that by keeping the doctrines and commandments of Christ. It's also in sharing the, hands, the same vision, which goes along with that. We all should have the same vision that we want to do what is right, we want to live right, and we want to go to heaven. And we want to help each other get there. 
we're looking for the same results. The same result is heaven. But if we're going down different pathways that cause problems or division, then we don't have the same vision. We are not looking for the same results. We may want them, but we're not striving for the same results. That's why in having the one hope, it helps us if we're doing that in unity, it helps us to have that same goal in mind and looking for the same results. Take rowing, for example. They usually have one on a rowing team called a caller. And that caller is calling the strokes as they're doing this. And one slight deviation can cause that boat to go off course. That's why these rowing teams practice day in and day out and they work on it to make sure they're stroking the oars at the same time to keep them going straight. To keep them going in that direction they're, they're looking for and that is the finish line to win that match. They have to stay together in order to achieve their efficiency. They're having to row together. So like I said, the slightest deviation, one person getting off just a little bit, is going to mess up the sink of that whole boat. And it's going to turn or slow them down and cause problems, and they're going to lose. So we have to strive for that one hope today. And in doing so, that hope will lead us to victory. And it's that victory not only in heaven, but when we think about the victory, here's the victory of unity and working together. So as we get in this lesson, there are just a few things we're going to look at, and the lesson will be yours. First is justification. We have to have the justification in that one hope. There's a man by the name of Hisham El Garouge. I don't know if you know of him. He was a world-famous Moroccan runner. He has been in several Olympics. He's won world championships, holds world records at this time. He wanted so badly to win the gold. In 1996 in Atlanta, he was leading the pack, and he stumbled, and he came in last. He was striving for gold. His goal was the gold. <laughs> he wanted to win that. And what is so interesting about it, he is not only mentioned from Morocco, but he holds seven of the eight fastest times in the 1500 meter race. And he was holding those times even before the Olympics. And yet one of the fastest men that has ever run and even leading the pack in the Olympics fell and came in last place. That was, his goal was not met. And up in until 2004, he had never even won a gold medal in the Olympics, as much as he tried. In 2000, he was out sprinted in just the last 100 meters of the race and came in second. One of the fastest men to ever run, they're saying. And you go back and look, and I didn't know a whole lot about him, but started doing some research and reading about him. He's world renowned in his speed and how quick he is on the track. I watched a video of him running and he not only outran the pack, he was close to 75 to 100 yards ahead of the other runners and they all were good runners. Yet he could not achieve that gold medal. In 2004, he knew that was going to be his last opportunity to win gold. And not only did he win one gold medal, but he won two gold medals in the 2004 Olympics. And even today, he, he holds three world records. One in the 1500 meter, one in the 2000 meter, and then a, a world record in the one mile. And they're saying it's going to take a, a while and a very good runner to ever beat what he's done. He won a justification. Justification for tripping and falling in 96. Justification for 2000 and barely being beat out for that gold medal. And he achieved his justification in 2004. 
Well, why are we even talking about that? <clears throat> because we can relate as human beings on things like running or other areas of this life that we want to justify ourselves in something. He wanted to justify himself. Well, how do we do that today? It's not going to be by running a, an Olympics and try to win a gold medal. But our justification is going to be through Christ, our only hope. We're talking about the one hope. And if we want justification, it's going to come through that one hope that is in Jesus Christ. Because of man's sins, he's been separated from God. And Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Our sins and iniquities separate us from God. It puts a wide chasm between us and God. And there is no hope when we're in that point. And the only hope we have is Christ. There's no remedy that man can invent, invent. There's nothing that man can do to heal division by doing it on his own. The only way we can achieve our justification is by obeying Christ. And there is only one hope. In Romans chapter 7 verses 24 and 25, Paul wrote to the Romans and said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? And notice the first part of verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we're going to have hope, it has to come through Christ. And it comes through Christ when we obey His gospel and when we live a faithful life. Over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, we're told that there's no other name can save us but the name of Jesus. That's the authority of Jesus. Because there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved, that verse tells us. It comes through Christ. And it is by that one hope that we're justified today for eternal life. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, we can read in this passage, But after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Notice how he saved us by his mercy. By the washing of regeneration, obeying the gospel, and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now look at verse 7. Now therefore being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs of according to the hope of eternal life. When we're justified by His grace, and how do we reach His grace? Through obedience to the gospel. God's grace is unmerited favor toward us. We don't deserve it, but He's offered it. But how can we receive His grace? Well, Titus 2, 11 and 12 tells us how we can receive His grace. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace teaches us something, doesn't it? That's what that, that passage teaches us. Grace teaches us that we deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We put those behind us. And we live soberly, clear-headed, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's how we receive God's grace. By humbling ourselves to him, obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then living a faithful life. But it is that hope that helps us to draw near to God today. In Hebrews seven nineteen, we can read, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. The law, referring back to the law of Moses, the law of Moses made nothing perfect for us. And Paul, or the Hebrew writer, we believe it's Paul, the Hebrew writer is telling us, and telling these people, particularly in their day, when you look at the immediate context for them, he's trying to show them in the book of Hebrews why the law of Christ is better than the law of Moses. 
and why these Jews need to stay with Christ and not go back into Judaism, not go back into the law of Moses, because it made nothing purpose, perfect. But the bringing of a better hope did. What is that better hope? Jesus Christ and the life he lived on this earth, the death that he died, shedding of his blood, his ascension back to heaven, being made king of kings and lord of lords. He is that one hope. We'll simply obey what he has said. We can enjoy that hope. But how does this hope unite us? Because we have to be one in recognizing in whom our hope lies. We've just been talking about that. Jesus Christ. We're one also in submitting in obedience to this one hope. We submit the obedience in obedience to Jesus Christ by his gospel in order to enjoy that hope. Now just think, folks, when we do those things that we've already been talking about, and there's a lot more, but when we do those things now, look at the unity we have, not only with one another, but most importantly in Christ. The unity in Christ is important, the most important. But if we have unity in Christ, we have unity with one another. But when we fall out with our unity in Christ by sinning and living a sinful life, then we can't be united together. As I mentioned earlier, as we began, you look at division that is caused in congregations. There's no unity there when there's division. Someone is not following Christ in the one hope. How to overcome that is if we're the ones in sin, we repent. Don't be stubborn, bullheaded. Don't think, well, I know more than everybody else here. Or I know what I'm going to do. We humbly submit ourselves to God to do His will. And when we're wrong, we need to admit it. And when we admit it and then repent, we can have that one hope with Christ. We're also one in appealing to others to come to this hope. It's not enough that we should want to have that one hope in our own lives, in our family, in our friends' lives, but in our brethren's lives, but others. That we should want to teach them the gospel of Christ and to help them come to this one hope. There is only one hope for man's justification. And that one hope is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 23 we can read, If you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which is preached unto every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul tells us, don't be moved away from that one hope. Don't leave it. If we don't have the one hope, it's because we left it. If we have the one hope, it's because we're faithful and we're living that life that God wants us to live. We sing a song in our songbook called, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We need to think of the words every time we sing any song, but think of the words of this song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But secondly, if we're going to have that one hope, we have to have the motivation for that. Stories told of the Klondike Gold Rush about 1896, that there was a gold rush, or gold found rather, in the Klondike River in Canada. Tens of thousands of people went from California and other places the Skagway, Alaska, said Canada, went to Skagway, Alaska. The supply station started off, and they still had a 600-mile journey over into Canada to the Yukon Territory. Thousands upon people arrived only to find out that all of the claims had already been staked. Now, can you imagine, they had motivation they were just a little late, but can you imagine traveling thousands and thousands of miles? We're talking about in the 1800s. They didn't have airplanes and jets. They didn't have cars with turbos in them that you could floor the thing and you could get there just very quickly. No, they, they were traveling by horse and buggy or horseback. And all these people were coming to find gold, had that gold fever. And they get up there and all the claims were staked. And by August of 1898, the rush was over. 
What motivated all these people to travel that distance? Invest all the money that they had and endured all the hardships that they endured during that time? The hope of what everybody says, striking it rich. Everybody thought we're going to go down into these, this river and we're going to find big chunks of gold the size of boulders and we're going to get rich. The claims are staked. People were getting their gold that, that staked the claims and everyone else was out of whatever they spent. Can you imagine what hardship some of those people had endured, not just in the journey, but in the disappointment of not being able to stake a claim or find any gold? And they had to go home empty-handed and broke, very likely. Just think in your own life what that would do to you. Imagine what they felt when it got to that point. They had motivation, but in the end there was no hope. It was too late. But hope motivates us, and it is the reason that we sing so many songs in our songbooks about hope. They can motivate us as we sing these songs and as we study our Bibles and we live a Christian life to achieve that hope one day. Having that hope helps us to be encouraged to live a faithful Christian life in the way we know we should be living. We know in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm not going to, for the sake of time, read this, Hebrews 6, 15 through 20, the Bible tells us God is not lying to us and not going to lie to us, but He's provided us hope. And our hope is a sure thing if we simply obey Him. Because of that great hope, we should be motivated to live a holy life. And that unifies us with Christ and with one another. But how does it unite us? It unites us when we share the same motivation, and when we do that, we can accomplish a lot more. If we have that same goal in mind and we're wanting to work together in unity, and folks, this one hope still goes back to unity, then we can accomplish so much. You think about what we can accomplish at spring if we have that unity. But if we have one person in this congregation that's not united, and they want to do their own thing, just think of what we're losing in not only motivation, but in the things we can't accomplish. Oh, we can still accomplish things without one person. But that one person could be a key to helping motivate others to accomplish more. But when you have people that are not united, you have problems. And that's why we should strive here at this congregation, no matter what has happened in the past, no matter what might even happen in the future. But we know what could happen in the future if we put our mind to it and we're united. We're not fighting against one another but we're unified with one another with the same goal in mind, the same goal as heaven, and the same goal as our love for one another's brethren. When we do that, then just imagine what we can accomplish, not only physically, but spiritually. Then finally, that hope leads us to salvation. There was a gentleman by the name of Aaron Ralston, and for Aaron Ralston, that beautiful spring day of climbing rocks was just another wonderful day to go out and enjoy the nature. We like getting out in nature, don't we? A lot of people do. Some people don't. This time of the year, I don't know. There's so much pollen. You want to stay inside. But anyway, it's beautiful outside. And this Aaron Ralston was climbing rocks and had a boulder fall on him. That boulder pinned him to the ground. He could not get up. He cried for help. And after several days of waiting on rescuers to arrive, he was about to give up hope. He'd run out of water, had nothing to eat, and he knew he was about to die. So he did the only thing he, he knew he could do to save his life. He pulled out his handy-dandy trusty pocket knife, and he cut his own arm off. He's either going to lie there and die or save himself in whatever way he could. And he decided physically he wanted to live. And so he did whatever he had to do. He had to cut off that part that was going to cause him to die. And because of that, he was saved physically. 
As Christians, we have hope for eternal salvation if we simply do what is necessary to be saved. Sometimes we have to cut off that appendage that is pulling us down. That may be family, may be friends. We have to get a, away from those things that pull us away from our service to Christ. And we have that eternal hope if we'll simply put our mind on the goal and live a faithful life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8 we can read, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet which is the hope of salvation. We put on these things, and Paul says a similar thing to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6. We have the armor in which we're to wear, to fight against the wiles of the devil. That gives us hope. How does this help unite us? Again, we have to have a common goal. We have to have common interest. And we have to look to the common end, and that end is salvation in heaven. What does a team do when they get to the end of their goal successfully together? They rejoice, don't they? I haven't been able to watch any of the March Madness basketball games, that's usually the only time I turn sports on and I get into things like that. And I still like college basketball. But when the team gets into the Sweet 16, then they narrow it down to four and then to the finals. Whoever wins that final match at the end of the playoffs, what do you think that team's going to do? They're going to rejoice. They'll be celebrating because they finished their goal and they won. Hope unites us. And we have a common hope in our justification, in our motivation, and finally in our salvation. But what is your hope? What is your hope today? Is it just to get through tomorrow and get back to work and do whatever you've got to do? Or whatever you're going to do around the house or... It's getting springtime, time to plant the garden. If you're going to plant a garden or go run errands, what, what's our goal? Yes, we're going to do all those material or physical things, but our ultimate goal is heaven. And as a child of God, if you're not living the faithful life that you should be living, you need to repent of your sins. If you're not living by that one hope and trying to not only unite yourself with Christ but with your brethren, you need to repent of your sins. And whatever sins you've committed in your life, if you've done so in a public manner, then publicly come and ask God to forgive you. If you're here and you're not a child of God, what is motivating you in your life right now? Work, friends, good times. What's motivating you in your life? What should be motivating you is you should want to go to heaven. And if you really want to go to heaven, you need to make changes in your life. Well, what can you do for that? And what can you do to get out of sin and become a Christian? When you hear the Word of God preached, it should develop faith in your life. In Romans 10, 17, the Bible says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, and you understand what the Word of God teaches, and you understand your responsibility to God and to Christ, and you understand that you're lost right now and you want to do something about that, then you come in faith changing your life in repentance. You turn away from a life of sin and you turn toward God, to obedience. And when you're willing to turn in repentance and put the sinful ways of your life behind you, then you confess Jesus with your mouth. And upon the confession of faith, you can be immersed into baptism for the remission of sins, to be added to the Lord's church, your name written in heaven, you start off a journey as a baby in Christ, learning what you need to do, taking those baby steps, but learning what you need to do to grow and to strive in that Christian life to mature and then one day have heaven as your home. If as a child of God you're not living right or if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, then we're going to sing an invitation song. That opportunity is given to you where you can make the appropriate changes or obey Jesus Christ to become one of God's children and start out on a journey to lead you to heaven one day in that one hope. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, we urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.